Okay. You're live and recording now. How exciting. So we'll wait two more minutes. And <coughs> somehow I just lost. Okay, I think Linda's going to find a new place. I, I just got out of the screen. I had to rejoin. Yeah. So, Linda, we just um, went live and we're going to record today. So, we're recording too. Okay. Yeah, but we're going to wait just another minute or so to start. And we have three guests in the room. We are calm next heart. Great. I'm going to go ahead and put everyone's email and information in the chat. <clears throat> Okay. Great. So everyone's website is in the chat, so it's easily available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Great. All right. So I guess we will get going here. I know it's a really full day. Hopefully everybody has a chance to look at all of the amazing offerings for the, um, the whole conference today. It's a busy day. I know you guys probably saw an email this morning where a panel was just added on Ukraine as well. So if you have time to check that out, we'll be thinking of everybody there today. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. This is... The Arts Empowering Via Visualizations of Climate Change. Um, I'm Emily Wilkerson, and I'm a writer and curator based in New Orleans. And I have the great pleasure to moderate this panel this morning with five amazing artists. And together, we are going to highlight the importance of arts and culture in discussions on climate change and how the artists are actively engaging in pressing issues of our time. This topic plays a big role in my personal curatorial and editorial practice as well. And it's very exciting because it sits at the intersection of many, many areas of practice and study, a lot of them being discussed throughout the day today. Um, from art and cultural production to theories of the public sphere, land art, climate change, environmental studies, migration and globalization, sociology, activism, feminism, and many more. As I began thinking about the discussion today, I turned to the writing of botanist Robin Wall Kimmer and her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. She says, action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. I'll just repeat that quote one more time. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. I hope you find the short presentations and discussion that follow today to embody Kimmer's words on this amazing reciprocal relationship between the self and the earth as well as healing and action. So for this next portion of the panel, I will present a guiding point uh, for consideration, you know, just thinking about this, this entire idea of artistic practice and empowerment through artistic practice. And each of the five artists today will spend a few minutes discussing their work. We'll also display an example of their work during their discussion. Then we'll take a few minutes to discuss a few questions, and after that, we'll open the floor to questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to begin today with a presentation, a short presentation by Linda Stillman, and this is going to focus on inspiration. So really thinking about how we can draw inspiration from our personal lives and our surroundings, and really think about this idea of climate-induced stress. Linda, if you'd like to start, it'll be about four or five, about five minutes or so. Thank you, Emily. I'm pleased to be here today. 
In my art, I investigate the passage of time in nature using diverse media, collage, painting, photography, and installation. My inspiration is the natural world around me, flowers, gardens, trees, as well as the sky overhead. My gardens provide me with many of my art materials. I grow flowers for pigment stain drawings. I've noticed over the years how the growing season has expanded, which means I can plant annuals early in the spring and many bloom well into October. It is a vivid reminder of the warming of the planet and how things are getting out of sync, especially with the invasive bugs and critters who need to know the cycle of the plants. Trees also provide me with materials. I collect leaves and press them to make into collages, which highlight the beautiful varied colors and shapes of nature. By sharing my love and knowledge of plants, I hope to inspire viewers to take a deeper interest in nature. I'd like to share with you a recent piece of mine, a giant wreath made of bittersweet vines. In my frequent walks along my road here in upstate New York, I try to identify the roadside plants. Recently, I've discovered that almost all of them are non-native invasives. Invasive plants are a huge threat to our environment, robbing native plants of light, water, and nutrients, and leading to a loss of biodiversity. And as the invasives replace the native plants, the birds and insects that evolved with them are existentially threatened. One of our most aggressive invasive local plants is oriental bittersweet, which I used in this wreath. The bittersweet vines are quite lovely, and in the fall, the orange and red berries are stunning. But birds eat those berries and spread them, creating more and more of the ubiqu ubiquitous vines that strangle the trees they climb. Warming temperatures and climate-induced stress on an ecosystem can make it easier for invasive plants to flourish. I think the most effective way to get people to care about climate change is for them to experience nature personally. It would be wonderful if everyone had the opportunity to be out in nature and to garden. The next best idea is to see art that gets them excited about nature. I don't think my art can change the world, but to paraphrase the ecologist Doug Ptolemy, knowledge generates interest and interest generates concern. So the more we can share information and love for nature, the more people will be concerned about mitigating climate change and protecting our planet. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. It's really, I think it's always very exciting to hear how um, you know, you draw different materials from the earth, but also really thinking about um, invasive and native and how those words might sit and resonate with us in different ways, both in an artistic practice, in the environment, and just as, as people. So welcome to the new folks that have joined. Um, I'm Emily, and I'm here with five artists today talking about their work. This is the arts empowering via visualizations of climate change. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Michelle Brody. And uh, uh, Michelle is going to speak about her work, but also really kind of tap into thinking about material and how we use material um, and how this relates to the environment and climate change. Um, every artist here today can speak at length about each of these topics. We're just kind of giving our audience guiding points to really think about um, these various aspects of creating, especially when we think about climate change. So Michelle, take it away. Okay, hi, good morning, or good afternoon for some people. Um, I'll just read a basic statement first about where I come from as an artist. Um, the essence of my work is, thrives on the interaction with new communities and placemaking, where I explore what it means to establish roots within an unfamiliar environment by being present within a place to affect change. Um, each new, new location, I conduct a careful investigative method 
that involves a gathering of regional materials, native plants, local stories, historic references, and architectural imagery. I, I employ this as a social practice to create site-generated works that illuminate the unobserved in the day-to-day -day and the challenges facing our environment. Right. Um, the conscious choice of utilizing natural materials really explores the history behind each um, substance that I use as a nuanced understanding of environmental flux and which is due naturally to entropy, but also to humid made um, climate change. And so from building from this unpredictable foundation, I invite community interaction across uh, like a virtual or an actual threshold to invoke uh, a visceral social encounter um, as a shared space to comment on our tenuous relationship between nature and us within the built environment. So the work that uh, I have on view is part of a larger series called Nature in Absentia. And this is just a beginning sample as a, a fragment of a lost marshland. Um, the work is uh, focusing on, similar to what Linda was speaking about, in terms of native, non-native, and invasive species, um, but also comparing that to um, loss of diversity, biodiversity, certainly inspired by Rachel Car Carlson and her book, Silent Spring, that's over 60 years ago was, was published to um, the expanding diversity of cultures and um, the human cultural diversity that's really throughout the world that's being forced and moved due to climate change. And um, so the work here is depicting native cattails in a so-called um, healthy pond, uh, but, the but this is handmade paper that I collected from, uh, from around uh, the Bronx, which is actually made from Phragmites, which is considered um, a non-native invasive species that's been pushing out a lot of the cattails from their environments around wetlands areas and is a sign of a, uh, an environment that's in distress. So on the, this is actually a double-sided work meant for a future installation where on the outside you see the native uh, cattails flourishing, but on the inside, on the other side, what you actually see are the empty caverns where the cast paper around the cattails themselves that I used are removed. So it's showing, it's sort of a visualization of that loss of the species. Um, and that physical, visceral experience of understanding where those materials came from and that the work isn't just a, an imagery, but it's actually the physical structure that is um, exemplifying that uh, change in climate and how species are not necessarily being lost, but they're moving. And that we have to understand that our environment is constantly in flux, whether it's human made or natural. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, gosh, you know, working in a practice in which you're thinking about how the world is constantly changing around you means that our practice is constantly changing and our response is constantly changing. So that's definitely something we can get into in a little while. Um, so next, Kathy Bruce is going to also speak a little bit about material, um, and Kathy is going to take us kind of out of the space of our studios, out of our heads a little bit, and into the environment. So, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what interests me is the way the female body and anatomy corresponds to structures in nature, plants, trees, and landscape. My artwork is a creative response to nature and the natural environment that manifests itself in the form of large site-specific outdoor sculptures utilizing sustainable materials. My selection of natural organic materials corresponds to the climate, ecosystem, 
plant and animal life in the environment that calls to mind an association between women and nature. Typically, I incorporate live plant material into or around the forms to become an integral aspect of them. Thus, the sculptures become a living addition to the natural environment while interpreting mythological or literary themes. Um, my approach is reflected in the words of Terence McKenna, who prophetically wrote in 1992, our present global crisis is more profound than any previous historical crisis. Hence, our solutions must be more drastic. Plants and the renewal of our archaic relationship with plants could serve as the organizational model for life in the 21st century just as computers operate as the dominant model in the late 20th century. McKenna discussed using plants to create a universal shift in viewpoint that would enable us to see plants as more than food, shelter, clothing, or even resources of education and religion. They would become models of progress. They are, after all, exemplars of symbiotic connectedness and efficient resources, recycling, and management. Um, the piece that you see here um, is a piece called Annabelle Lee by the Sea, which is based on an Edgar Allan Poe heroine. Uh, it's a work that I built in King Kingsbury Gardens in St. Andrews, Canada in 2019. And the figure was built in a secluded secret garden where the audience, the people walking through the park, would gradually come into this Oh, this small in, intimate space and view the sculpture of the figure gazing toward the sea and St. Andrews. Um, and it sort of exemplifies my goal um, in my public sculptures that call attention to the necessity to respect and preserve green and sustainable global environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I think it's, um, you know, I love hearing the role of literature, how it plays um, an important uh, part of your practice. And really just once again, like thinking all these areas of influence from our surroundings that impact the way that we think and create and the actions that we take. So thank you for sharing that. So next up, we are going to hear from Susan Honig, who is going to highlight um, just exactly what I mentioned in a different dimension, the role that collaboration plays in creating work about our environment. Um, so Susan, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much. So since 2006, I've worked every Sunday during banding season, which is from May through November at sunrise. We meet up in the Sourland Mountains. I work with a bird bander biologist and a few other people at the Featherbed Lane bird banding station, as I said, in the Sourland Mountains of New Jersey, where I see firsthand the life cycle of birds and the conditions and habitat in which they live. And we see many migrating birds coming through that make stopovers here as they go to their summer or wintering grounds. Migrating birds require foods high in protein, such as the abundance of berries in the sourlands. A changing climate has altered the activities of birds and plants. Timing in nature is of utmost importance. And in this experience I have, I see very clearly how the health of forest life depends so much on, a, on the climate. And with climate change, many of these birds that come through, whether they're regional or long distance migrate migrants are affected. And so actually in 2014, I did this painting that you see here called the Arctic Tundra. Because growing up in New England, I often saw a lot of terns coming through, going up to the Arctic. And in this painting, there's a turn at the bottom. And in any case, I want to mention that my experience in the Sourland Mountains, in the forests there, has greatly influenced my work from years ago to my present work, where I work with ecological sculpture on creating other um, 
ways for people to come to see what's going on, which you can see on, on my website. This painting is called the Arctic Tundra that you see here. I was interested to learn about animal life in the tundra ecosystem. The permafrost soils are the most distinctive characteristic of the Arctic, where very shallow rooted plants grow. Climate change with warming temperatures is thawing the permafrost. The shifts between warm and then cold creates hard layers of ice instead of the loose powdery snow. When the rain falls on the snow in the Arctic, when it, because it's warm, warmer, it freezes, making a very hard um, surface for animals to get to the plants and food they need to serve, excuse me, to survive. In the Arctic, staying in sync with the environment is life or death, the struggle to find food and the loss of camouflage means vulnerability for predation. And the animals here in the outer circle from clockwise starting at the top are, is the snowy owl, which eat 1,600 lemmings per year. Without snow, this powdery snow, the lemmings are not insulated. So it's very hard for them to survive. Therefore, it affects the snowy owls. The next animal is the Arctic hare. And the main problem with the changing temperatures is that the Arctic hare, which typically camouflages itself from brown to white in the winter, it just doesn't happen. The next is a ptarmigan which is a northern grouse. The next is an ermine, which is like a short-tailed weasel. Again, lack of camouflage for this, for this um, ermine makes them very vulnerable. The next is a polar bear. The loss of sea ice threatens their main prey, seals, which need ice to raise their young. So polar bears, how are they managing? How are they getting their food? Next is a caribou, which is a type of a reindeer, which um, is affected by the ice, which traps their food. The next after the caribou is a lemming. As I said before, the lemmings have a hard time surviving. And then the Arctic tern, which is the longest, has the longest migration of any animal and annually making the journey from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic in search of sunlight, 50,000 miles a year in search of food. The next animal is a wolverine. And they need snow, deep snow, so they can dig dens to protect their young. The next is an Arctic fox, which is critically endangered. And then the Arctic lynx which thrive in the frigid tundra, snow cover and food availability, which is changing, changed. And the last animal up there is a musk ox. The musk ox is actually a native animal to the Arctic tundra. It roams in search of roots, mosses, lichens that sustain them. In the winter, they use their hooves to break through the snow and the ice to graze on plants. Climate change has affected and threatened the existence of all these animals. There's such a struggle to find food. Their life is definitely endangered. And um, that's what I try to convey in, in the painting and with all my work up to my present work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for walking us through also all of the details of that incredible work and um, really helping us think about and consider just every aspect of life that you've represented um, and how it's affected by our environment, for sure. So, you know, I think looking forward and looking back is a very big part of everyone's practice here. 
Um, and I think many, again, many other topics in today's presentations throughout uh, the conference. And thinking specifically about time, uh, we'll turn to Fern Schaefer, our last artist presentation before we um, start a discussion. So Fern, we'll let you take it away. Hey, um, I do a lot of different kinds of artwork. I do painting and, um, <clears throat> and installations. I started doing rituals in about 1982, 83, um, because I was very interested in our energy and how we connect with the earth. And I kind of view the rituals as going into areas that are in need of some sort of attention, need some sort of help. So as um, I progressed in using a shamanic approach to the earth, my costume is um, made of artist materials. That's canvas and raffia and um, all sorts of little items that I worked into the costume having to do with the industrial age because that time we were all concerned about changing into the future and to how we're going from one place to another. Um, so they became represents representative images and pieces from the world that we were at moving into the future. So this, um, and I worked with an, another artist, Otello Anderson, and we decided after doing many different kinds of rituals that we wanted to do a ritual that was longer and that was more intense. So we chose a nine year ritual being that nine was a healing number and that um, we would go out once a year at a different time. So we set up a schedule. We started in a January and then finished in September. So we would finish on nine, nine, nine. And we did everything according to, to nines. Um, so here we were invited to Esalen um, to a conference. And that happened to be on the date that we had promised that we would do a ritual. And so they agreed that we could have the morning off and that we went off and did this. And this is for the specific ocean and the fact that we've overfished the oceans and they were polluting the oceans, that somebody should speak up about that. So the photographs become a memory of the event and it allows me to talk about it. I give lectures and I go and show these uh, wonderful pictures and talk about what's needed and what we're doing. And um, the rituals all start out the same with some sage and we do some cleansing of the air and the space. And depending on where we end up, um, this one was specific ocean, but another time we ended up going to Wisconsin to the food belt and how it was, we're poisoning ourselves. So another time I've gone to the Miss the head of the Mississippi river, because the rivers are so important, important. So over the nine years, we really reached a lot of places. So I kind of think of the earth needing some um, tr treatment in a way, like we would go and they put the needles inside of you, you know, that kind of energy is for healing. I use my energy to heal the earth and the energy is always there. It's some people have more of it than others. I mean, if you think of the entertainment world, Oh my God, when Michael Jackson came on stage, he, he electrified the whole audience, thousands of people or Mick Jagger or Tina Turner. I mean, these people come on and they energize everyone. So energy can be used to stimulate ideas. So um, I thank you. It's a pleasure to be with such prestigious artists. Yeah. Thank you, Fern. Thank you for also bringing in some pop culture references to really <laughs> help us. <laughs> There's nothing like a mentioning Michael Jackson to really get ears perked up. And <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, that 
I can't think of anybody that's really newer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you could say, yeah, absolutely. That for a few, definitely a few performing artists. Um, and really, you know, that is also when you're thinking about your practice in particular, really tapping into just, just how we can transform our space energetically, visually sound. I think each artist here is always thinking about all of these elements, um, whether it's through their inspiration for the work, the materials they choose, where they display it or perform, and who's engaged um, in viewing or experiencing the work. So um, before you know, we turn it over to see if there's any questions from the audience, um, I will go ahead and just say, if anybody in the audience has a question that they would like to put in the comments, um, just please go ahead and do that. We don't want to miss any questions today. Um, I have a few questions just to get to keep things really open and thinking about action um, and really thinking about how, um, you know, this how art um, can really reach more people um, and how our role as artists or writers or cultural producers uh, how we can support and as you know individuals working with corporations or in governments like all these different aspects of how we can help continue to think about art as activism and art as um, empowerment for change so uh, Susan and Michelle I have a question for you all that um that well I shared before so this will be exciting <laughs> But it's a really big question when we think about creating anything. Um, I know it's on our minds constantly. So when we think about creating work that addresses climate change, who are we making work for? So either Susan or Michelle, if one of you all would like to go first. I will. That's Well, I believe that, and I try to, in my own practice, engage everyone from young children to people who've never set foot in the forest ecosystem. In my recent work, I've created leaf sculptures beneath trees in a number of different places where people learn about different biomes, different habitat, etc., in the forest and seeing how they how it's changed. And often I've I've found that people learn about climate change through intellectual capacities they hear about it they read about it this they learn about it through tv they don't really many people don't really experience walking in the forest and so for instance my uh, leaf walks i give in a hundred acre preserve across the street um, from where I live, um, engage a lot of people through advertising and local newspapers. And I've had people who absolutely, they just are so interested. They just, they're right behind me when I talk. Literally, I'm, I'm rather uh, small. And there are people literally like, hey, just looking over me. They can't get enough. They can't learn it and see enough. And the same is true with, uh, for instance, I led a group of Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts through. And their questions are marvelous. And so I, I feel that it's really important to engage the young and the old and, and people with um, and, and all in between, everybody. And, but the question is how to engage them. And I think that's what we're all experiencing in our work. And that's that's my aim to to get to people and for people then to express interest to come back and return and ask me questions. So that's that's my biggest aim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to build on that, um, because I, I live in the city, I live in New York City and I I'm in the Bronx, which happens to be the green considered one of the greenest boroughs of the five of them. Um, what I've been really interested is just engaging people in this space to be more aware of what they're passing around them and the changes in the nature just around them because they're uh and that relates to the invasive species or changes in in um in the lack of biodiversity and what's overtaking what's been native but really again it's all ages and even when i travel um 
it's always amazing to just touch people and hear them say, oh, I hadn't thought about that before. I hadn't seen that before. And that's as the artist is that always that intriguing finding out, well, what is the story here? Yeah. I think you both bring up an important point about engagement and um and I think a lot about how this connects to the importance of how different everyone's practice is here. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to a yoga class, um, but I also teach yoga. And one thing we would often talk about um, with a group of teachers is when you start to listen to how many times a yoga teacher or a professor really of many different types is really saying the same thing over and over and over again but we all have a different way of saying it and we all have a different voice and you never know when that one person in the room is going to hear how, you know, it's just going to land finally just one cue or one point or one direction is just going to land in a way that finally sticks. Um, and I think about that a lot when I think about artistic practice and the messages that we're trying to convey and how different each of your practices are when we think about, you know, we're saying we're saying very similar things in a way or to an end that is raising awareness that hopefully creates an action, um, but through different media. So with that in mind, um, Linda and Kathy, I would love to hear from you both about what specific aspects of the environment you address in your work and what actions you wish viewers to take after seeing or participating in your work. And really emphasizing like the specific action side of things. Linda, would you like to go first? Um, I was really intrigued by the reaction I got when I showed that bittersweet wreath last summer. Uh, I have not previously done any kind of message work, but that really resonated with people. I had mobs of people coming up to me at the opening and wanting to talk about the invasives in their yards. And it was really exciting that I could share my research and my information through my artwork. And the action I encourage them all is to get rid of the invasives and to find out what plants are invasive and get rid of them in a responsible way, not using chemicals. Um, so that was a really wonderful experience doing uh, a show about invasives and seeing the positive reaction from people. I also um, have a daily practice of documenting the sky and it's I've started in 2005 and it's wonderful that so many of my friends and people I've shown my work to email me pictures of the sky. Oh, Linda, I thought of you when I saw the sky. So I really feel like I've reached people into paying attention to their environment and hopefully treasuring the planet more because of that. Awesome. And thank you, Linda. Okay, How about I would just add to, I would add to um, Linda was talking the other day about how she has a garden and she working in her garden inspires her as an artist um, to be involved with nature. And the more people who have gardens, the more, um, we can touch the environment and understand the issues. And I think that one of the responsibilities really uh, rests with artists to not simply show people images of climate change, to not give graphs and, and charts and things, but to really work with sustainable materials that really show this is, this is nature working that to make the art and to inspire people to understand that and to have that experience. Um, I think it's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, one question that I have next, um, we have about seven minutes left. Um, so we have two more questions. And of course, um, there's always room for, you know, hopefully a question or two at the end. Um, but Fern and Susan, I would like to know where you see your works being displayed in a way that makes the greatest impact on climate change. And I know this is a doozy of a question, <laughs> but, you know. I'll go. Um, my work is displayed in museums or in classrooms. I love giving lectures. so. Um, it's a lot of fun for me to show the slides and then have reactions to the people. 
<clears throat> but every time I do that, I'm educating as I'm going along. So I feel that's really important. And, um, you know, if I had my way, if we would do it on television, we would, you know, try and reach many more people. But as artists, we're limited in not, I shouldn't say we're limited. It's harder to reach huge groups of people. <coughs> do. There's no question about it. But I think that the fact that we are all interested in the environment and change is what I'm saying enhances someone else's work. I mean, we're really all in this together. I feel a kinship with all of you because you, you, I love to garden. My house is filled with plants. You know, my name is Fern and I've had, you know, I did a whole series of healing plants in my paintings and I wanted people to be confronted with them and to see what an icon looks like a plant. We need these people. We need these plants around us. So um, it's good to bring us all into it. Well, right. So one great experience that I'm presently having is um, collaborating with um, Princeton High School students, a project that I've been working on <clears throat> and they have been working on about climate change, uprooted trees, and magic cicadas. Princeton was a hot spot. All the way back for every 17 years, the cicadas come out. Even Bob Dylan was affected by the cicadas many years ago and giving a, a, ta a speech and he wrote a song, The Day of the Locust. But I am collaborating with Princeton High School students and we're going to have an exhibition in the spring. Actually, there will, there will be a, an event on Earth Day. And, I, and I've shown my work and collaborated with other high schools around here and I find it a great satisfaction with working with students and high school students and their involvement. After all, it's very important that um, these people, these younger people know, really know about what is happening in the world. So that's what I'm involved with right now. Uh, thank you for these reflections. And this actually kind of feeds right into my next question, which is really like how how can philanthropists and others such as teachers, government officials, corporations support artists in ways that magnify these observations, questions, and urgent needs? I think you all hinted at some of them just now, um, but maybe Michelle and Kathy, if you would like to add anything um, here as well, that'd be great to hear from you as, as well. Um, just one thing when I was rereading your question that I saw was that I am really excited to see so many more opportunities being funded out there for um, community-based organizations and grants um, and relief funds for artists to produce community-based work. Um, sometimes it's, it's a challenge um, to incorporate the community and really create that bond, but um, having been working as this um, eco artist or environmental based artist for over 20 years, um, it's been really exciting and scary at the same time to see so many more um, support out there for artists to be presenting work out in the communities um, outside of the traditional gallery or museum context. Um, for people to experience and think about and be sensitized to these current issues. Absolutely, yeah, I think, you know, really thinking beyond, outside of the box in any way or form, um, how, we can, how we can bring our work to the world. Kathy, would you like to add anything? We're kind of, some of our, yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, well, I know some of our, um, 
our internet connections are a little stable and unstable. And I know my network is not stable. I just got a message. Sorry about that. Here we are, Zooming the conferencing from home world that we live in. Um, well, we have just a few minutes left. I want to make sure if there's any questions from the audience that um, we get to address those here today. And we have a few people listening in. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'll just keep it open. Um, if there's any questions among the panelists um, that you'd like to revisit with your colleagues here and friends, we'll leave a little space for that as well. Oh, Linda, I think you're on mute. It always happens. Um, two of the artists here are part of a wonderful book that I think should be mentioned. Could you, oh, okay. could you talk about that, Susan and and is it Kathy or Fern who are in it? Um, it's called Echo Arts, and it just came out. And um, I think the College Art Association is also speaking at this time, and so. Um, they're doing some promotion for the book on that, but it took about three years to put together. And um, the Echo Arts Group is a listserv, from what I understand, with about 200 members. And um, they put out a call if people would like to submit some ideas for workshops or about their cases or about their work. So it's got multi levels of information in it. Um, and I think it's about $35 and you can go to the echo art space list to order it. I think it would be good to put up. It's called echo art, art in action. Great. Um, the book and, um, um, I don't have the, do you have the exact, um, I don't have a copy of it cause I gave my copy away to uh, a writer to do, do it. So I can't hold it up and I haven't been, it hasn't been replaced yet, um, but I know it's coming. Great. Added the name of the book to the chat. Oh, so this, okay. is, this is it. Oh, it's, wonderful. It's a beautiful cover. Mm -hmm. All right. Step back. That's it. That's there great. I like it. Art in action. Yeah. Talk about how people can get involved, right? And help share our work. There we yeah. go. Mm -hmm. There are how many? There are, um, I believe, 76 artists in here. Wow. And there are many different um, exercises, um, activities, case studies, and provocations for classrooms right. and communities. Edited mm -hmm. by Amara Geffen, and Rosenthal, Chris Montel, and Aviva Romani. And... Um, it's definitely, it just came out and um, it's a wonderful book for, for many different people to, to be involved in learning about um, the habitat, climate change and our, our world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for mentioning that and sharing that. I'd also like to say I'm really pleased that this conference has included artists because I don't think every business conference does. And it shows... Yeah. Um, a sensitivity and enlightenment that I will really welcome as an artist. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that, Linda. Yeah. There's amazing panels throughout the entire day, arts and otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. And we are actually out of time for today. So I just wanted to thank everyone that attended um, and thank each one of you. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and to hear from you. Um, thank you for all of the work you do day in and day out. Um, and I look forward to staying in touch with everyone. And um, for anybody in attendance, of course, websites are in the chat. Um, and I look forward to the time that we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.